Amen. All right, we ready to study God's word this evening? Okay. While we're driving here, my wife was like, "Well, where where are we uh, in this in this whole Bible series?" And 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 then she kind of figured that we were just getting started. Uh, uh, and there's there's still so much to go. There's so much to learn in the Word of God. But uh, I'm glad that most of you have joined us for the ride so far, and I'm glad that we can continue to learn. So many things that you're probably not going to learn in Bible school or in just any other regular presentation. But it's in God's Word, so we'll learn about it anyway, right? So thank you guys for coming. And uh, for those watching online, as always, thank you guys for, for tuning in tonight. So last week, we, we've kind of been in the series, a sub-series, talking about uh, demons you know, the spirit world and talking about demons. And, and the, the section of talking about, of, of what we've been talking about demons has kind of just been more about the origins, right? The origins of the devil and the origins of demons. And I think for the last three weeks, we've kind of been in that. We've not even started talking about, you know, how demons operate, how they work, how you cast them, how you get rid of them and their influence on the earth. But we were trying to understand how the, these, these demonic devilish beings come about. Um, and, of course, as, as I dig in and as I study and as I always prepare, God just seems to have so much more. And so I have so much more tonight for you guys that you may not necessarily read or things you may read in the Bible and you probably skip over because you don't understand it. We're going to dig into it tonight. All right. So last week we, we were, we've kind of been in Genesis chapter 6 from verse 1 to verse 4. And in that way, linked to Jude and Second Peter, because those three scriptures are kind of interlinked when talking about um, the origins of demons and how they produce giants in the earth and, and stuff like that. Um, and last week we talked about um, Genesis 6, verse 1 to 4, and how we talked about what happened when the sons of God saw that the, the daughters of men were fair and were beautiful, and then they came down and they slept with. And, and, and I disputed and for this week and probably next week, I will keep on showing you biblical proofs as to why I completely disagree with the evangelical consensus. Not all, but some. Um, yeah, yeah, on, on this topic and why they're completely biblically wrong. Because they seem to not be able to read past a basic understanding of the text they're reading. And not understanding that if they actually sit down and study God's word, they will... They will, they will see so much more. You know, it's, it's just the same thing with my crusade against, cessa yeah, cessationists. It's, 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 they, they pick one thing and then they twist it. But, all right, we're ready to get into it. All right, so tonight we're going to be talking about three tribes. I call them three tribes, even though the Bible doesn't call them that, okay? It's the, um, they are the Rephaim, the Anakim. Oh, I forgot the last one. It should come back to my mind. But three tribes. And what, see, what three tribes? Three tribes of giants in the Bible. All right, three tribes of giants, and where did these people come from? Now, of course, what was funny is um, I looked up and Brother Terry was singing a song about David slaying the giants. And I was like, all right, I guess, God, you have, to have a sense of humor tonight uh, in bringing that song. But I am trying to prove tonight how these giants were not product, products of two human beings, but products of the daughters of men and beings that were not human. And, of course, in this sense, we talk about them being demonic. And, and, and I'll show you all that. But I'll kind of trace their history through, through Genesis, through Deuteron uh, um, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all the way to the book of Judges. Um, because one of the last times that we also see the battle between giants and God's people is, is, you know, David and the times of David. And, and that era kind of ended with that. But, but there were these beings on earth, giants. And, and when, 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 when we think of human giants, right, we probably just think, oh, man, we saw this basketball player, and he is eight feet tall, and we say he's a giant. Okay, now when the Bible was talking about giants, he was not talking about eight feet tall basketballers, Okay. As we would think, whoa, that guy's a giant. I mean, can he, he has to probably bend his head down coming through um, the, the front doors over there. But no, we're talking about, and, uh, and the funny thing is the Bible actually just gives us some of the measurements in cubits. So we then, of course, convert it to feet and inches um, of 
how big these giants were, how big these beans were. Um, so we're going to get into that tonight. So let's go back to Genesis chapter 6, because that's kind of what underpins everything that we're studying here for this week and, and, and next week. Genesis chapter 6, verse 1 to 4. Now, you know, if you read it just like every other Bible verse, you, you might not realize that there is, there is so much within those first few verses that we could, grab, we could get answers for if we just sit and use that as, as the lens through which, which, which we study all of Scripture and what Scripture has to say about demons and giants. So let's go back to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6, verse 1. I know we've read it before, but I want us to read it again. Now it came to pass, when man began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them. Now watch this. Now watch this. It says... When man began to multiply. All right. How do we multiply? Sex. Between what and what? A goat and a man? No. We multiply by a man and a woman. The union of a man and a woman is what multiplies. That was God's divine order in Genesis chapter 1. Right? Multiply. Fill the whole earth. And so Adam and Eve would come together in a union and give birth to Cain and Abel and Seth later on, right? That is God's divine order. So, of course, when the Bible is talking about multiplication of men on the earth, he is clearly, simply, there's no confusion about it, right? And there's a reason why, because we're going to use this to launch against people's, people's teachings. There's no confusion that when the Bible is talking about multiplication of humanity, it is a man and a woman producing children, right? That's an established fact, all right? No disputes there. Okay, now let's read on with that understanding. When men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, right? Just like honor has been born to us. That, okay, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they choose. Of all whom they chose. Now, here's what I want to say. If, if the sons of God were just regular men, because the, the evangelical consensus to a degree says these men are, they're just, they're just the sons of the line of Seth, and I'll attack that later on, but just for this, if they were regular men, it would mean that the writer of the Bible does not know tenses or language. Because that's very redundant to start the verse by saying, well, there was multiplication and sons and daughters were being born. And then this happened. There, there's, that, that doesn't make any sense, right? So it has to be something different. It has to be something different because it's already been established in the first verse that Sons and daughters were being born to men. Daughters were being born, born to men. Daughters came about. Men were multiplying on the face of the earth. So the fact that the word man is used there automatically denotes that this is humanity we're talking about here. But something happens. Some, now verse one, is, verse 1 is not too different, right? This is God's order from Genesis chapter 1. Go and multiply, fill the earth, reproduce. God's order is for everything to rep reproduce after its own kind, right? Lions make lions, right? Dogs make dogs, cats make cats. Human beings make human beings. That's God's divine order, is that we reproduce after our own kind. Not a distortion of God's order. Well, last week we talked about God's divine order and how man likes to trump God's divine order in many ways. And then verse 2 says that the sons of God saw the daughters of men. Okay, so that means men were already multiplying. And these guys saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful. And they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. Okay, pause. Why will God be angry at his own order? Why will God, if you are married to somebody and you produce children, is God going to be mad at you? No. The Bible says children are a heritage from the Lord. 
Blessed is the man who has his quiver full of them. God loves children. God loves us to have many children. God wants us to not depopulate the world. He says multiply and fill the earth. So you see all those billionaires who are trying to bring up depopulation ideas. They should go to hell. That's where they belong. That's against God's divine order. God, the earth is never going to become too populated. So why do we see that God says in verse 3, my spirit shall not strive with man forever. Why is God mad and decides to reduce the age of humanity to 120? Think about that. We all live and we do not generally live past 120 years old. I mean, 95% of us will not make it to 100. Talk about 120. Now, the Japanese tend to go, tend to go a little uh, older and live to 105 and 110. And, and here and there, you may see one woman that lives to 115, 118. I mean, the oldest woman in the world living today is like 119 year, 119 years old. There, there are still some, some uh, I think I was reading the other month, the, the last woman who, who was from three centuries. She was born in the latter end of the, the 19th century, and she just passed away. You know, 120. But, but, but it's not going above 100. It's, it's, that's where it is. That's where it's at, right? God has, that's kind of the mark God has given. It's about 120, right? About 120. Why will God, so before this, now before this, we know that man lived for hundreds of years, right? Methuselah lived for how many years? 787. Noah, I mean, 600. I mean, these guys lived 600 years, 500 years, and they were not 400 years. You, you read through the genealogies in, in chapter 4 and chapter 5, and you see people lived a long time. Lamech, all these people lived, no one, they lived long. And they had children and grandchildren and great and great and great and great. And suddenly God says, I am done wrestling with man. I will not, my spirit will not strive with man, for he's in good flesh, and I will bring the curse. This is the third curse that God brings upon man. After he's cursed Adam and Eve, and, of course, the serpent, and he curses man again. Why? Why does God bring curses down? Because man disrupt his order. Every time God has released a curse, it's because there has been a defiance of God's order. When he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, it was because they were doing something that was in defiance of God's order. God destroys when man defies his divine order. Right? Do not eat of this fruit. They went and ate of it. They were cursed for it. Disobedience, rebellion brings about God's wrath. But thankfully, through Jesus Christ, God's wrath on us is taken away. But we know that the result of someone defying God's order is what? God's wrath. So if the sons of God that saw the daughters of men were just the sons of regular human beings from the line of Seth, then it makes no sense again as to why God would be angry with man and curse him just because why? Because men slept with women and had children. That doesn't make sense. All right, are you following me? I am trying to defy the stupid, stupid conclusions of these theologists. They just read past it. They don't want to dig in. Okay, let's go on. And then verse 4. If you didn't get any point from the first three verses, verse 4 says, There were giants on the earth in those days and also afterwards. So when this book was written, he was like, there, was, there are no giants right now because there were giants then. It's like, you know, if, if, it's like talking to someone who is, you know, uh, my wife and I were this past weekend in Enid and we're talking to this guy who was 96 years, was 96 years old, lived in Enid all his life. And he was even there when, you know, the Vance Air Force Base was built in 1940, 42. And, you know, he was talking about, man, in those days, you know, you know, this whole place that you see, this whole built up community, we were all hunting ducks out here and everything in those days. Well, it's no longer that way, right? So it's the same thing the writer of Genesis here is saying. It's like, in those days, in, 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 in saying that, he's saying, well, I know you guys don't see giants right now. But in those days, there were giants on the earth. And afterward, we'll come to that, very important. When the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every intent of 
The thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. All right. And of course, God talks about the flood there. And, 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 but why? Why will sexual acts between a man and a woman as divine by God be something that breaks God's heart? It's not. So that tells me that the sons of God are not regular human beings. Now, we'll come to why they're not the sons of Seth, which is a theology say. That's another stupid idea. We'll just destroy that. But again, so we know we're establishing something here. We're establishing that there was a disruption, right? These guys, whoever they were, whoever these sons of gods were, decided to commute with man, deal with daughters of men, and bring about these giants. In the Hebrew, I asked, I brought my Hebrew Bible to the last time. I said these giants were called the Nephilim. That's what, that's what they were called, the Nephilim. So, there were giants born. Now, we read through the Bible and we see a lot. In fact, it, 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 you know, here's the thing. You would have to not believe the Bible to believe that they have never been giants on the earth. Because there are some people who will go, well, you know, these, the Bible is a book of myths. And they talk about um, all these giants. They've never been giants. Well, if you're a Christian, you've got to believe what the Word of God says. It is established over 25 times when the children of Israel go into to scout the land of Canaan. What report do they come back with? They say they are like giants. They, and we are like what? Grasshoppers before them. Man, these guys are big. We're frightened. Now, if it was a six foot five inches guy going up and see maybe a six foot four inches guy, he'd be like, there is no way he would come back and go, whoa. In fact, if he was to have a refrain, all he would say is, okay, I need to spend the next two months just pumping those irons and becoming as buff as that guy. Now I'll have a chance, right? That would have probably been the response. Like, you know what? Give us two months. Let's. Let's get in the gym, and let's get a little buffered. But you're certainly not adding one foot to your life. I mean, I wish I could. Boom, boom, Stoney. <laughs> boom. <laughs> to five, six, five, seven. You're like, oh, six foot man. I could play basketball now. That's not going to happen, right? <laughs> Keep laughing. Okay. <laughs> amen. That's not going to happen. Terry, say amen. Yeah, you, yeah, you. <laughs> There are giants. There were giants. So now it's, it's a certainty that there were giants. But how did they come about? And what, what allowed this to happen? Because evidently the fact that there were giants was something God hated. Over and over again, Scripture is clear that God hated the fact that there were giants on the earth. Right? We've seen this right here in Genesis. And we'll see it in Deuteronomy. We'll see it in, 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 when, we, when we go to Numbers. I'll show you. Right? The children of Israel were always fighting the sons of Anak, Anak, Anakim, or the, the Rephaim. They were always fighting. God did not like these people. In fact, God had to destroy them twice. First, before the flood, and secondly, after the flood. So they were giants. And the union of these beings with the daughters of men produced giants. Not what God ordered. God made man and woman. He didn't make giants. So, already, that has been established. All right. Now, I want to show you a little bit more about who these guys are, right? The, the, the Nephilim and the giants, right? Let, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 1. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 28. Um, just kind of, maybe, I guess we could just call tonight's Bible study giants. Probably, probably stay there for a little while. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 28. Where can we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying, These people are greater and taller than we. The cities are great and fortified up to heaven. Moreover, watch this. Moreover, we have seen the sons of the Anakim there. Okay, so to use the word, the sons of the Anakim, it means that the children of Israel knew about these people. They had heard about them. Right? It was no longer just a myth. This was something that people knew. We saw the sons of Anakim there. If they were able to report this to Israel and say, hey, man, we saw the sons of Anak there. Like, man, what would be the automatic assumption? Man, these people, they're giants. They're giants. They come from Anak. The sons of the Anakim we found there. All right? All right. 
Still Deuteronomy chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 10. I'll see, I'll show you another group of giants. The Emim. Are you in Deuteronomy 2, verse 10? All right. The Emim had dwelt there in times past. Watch this. A people as great and numerous and what? Tall as the Anakim. They were also regarded as giants like the Anakim, but the Moabites called them Emim. And the Horites formerly dwelt in Sarah, but the descendants of Esau dispossessed them and destroyed them before them and dwelt in their place, just as Israel did to the land of their possession, which the Lord gave them. The sons, the descendants of Esau dispossessed them. All right, there's, I'm, I'm going to come back to that. But I'm just showing you these pictures of, of giants in Scripture. All right, still in Deuteronomy um, Let's actually do, let's actually do verse 20 of chapter 2. Verse, verse, verse 20 of chapter 2, still in Deuteronomy. All right. That was regarded as a land of giants. Giants formerly dwelt there. Right. These were not normal people. All right. Giants formerly dwelt there. Where? In the land of Ammon. If you read up, that's, that's the land it's talking about, the land of Ammon. All right? But the Ammonites called them Zamzumim. <laughs> right? So these guys have different names. Right? Some people call them Zamzumim. Some people call them Emim. And the Israelites just call them the Anakim. All right? Verse 20, verse 21. A people great and numerous and tall as the Anakim. But the Lord, what did the Lord do? He destroyed them before before them, and they dispossessed them and dwelt in their place, just as he had done for the descendants of Esau who dwelt in Sarah when he destroyed the Horrorites from before them. They dispossessed them and dwelt in their place even to this day. And the Avim who dwelt in the villages as far as Gaza, the Kaphtorim who came from Kaphtor, destroyed them and dwelt in their place. Do you see a, um, and then of course when you go to verse, verse 26 to chapter 3, we talk about King of King Og of Bashan. We'll come to that. But is, do you see a recurring theme? God destroyed them. This is a different line. This is a different strand of people. These are not just normal human beings, right? The, the, the descendants of Esau uh, had destroyed them in, in, in the land of Ammon. They had called them the Horrorites, right? And God was saying, okay, I'm bringing you to the land of Ammon, and I'm going to have you also displace and dis what does it mean to destroy? It means exterminate. It's not just, I'm killing them. I mean, take them out of existence. Why? These guys were not in God's divine plan. These giants were not. You'll see that over again. They were not. And God is like, I'm going to destroy them. How? He says, moreover, just as I have done with the sons of the Anakim, giant, giant, giant. We'll see more of these giants in Scripture, right? Um, so... Let's do chapter 9. Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 2. Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 2. Let's read from verse 1 so you just have the context, right? God is basically talking about their rebellion, Israel's rebellion here. Hear, O Israel, you are to cross over the Jordan today and go into dispossessed nations greater and mightier than yourselves. Cities that are great and fortified up to heaven. A people that are what? Great and tall. Descendants of the Anakim, whom you know. Remember I told you earlier, the Israelites knew them. Whom you know, and of whom you heard it said, who can stand before the descendants of Anak? Therefore, understand today that the Lord your God is he who goes before you as a consuming fire. He will do what? Destroy them and bring them down before you so you shall drive them out and destroy them quickly as the Lord has said to you. Now, you say, Stoney, what is, uh, I, see, I see your giants. I want, to, I, want, I want you to do something. We're going to link what we're going to read in the next four verses to Genesis chapter 6, verse 1 to 4. Right? Are you ready? You ready? Okay. If before you said, Stoney, well, you've not fully established this, this connection between wickedness and the giant. Well, watch this. Are you ready to go forward? 
All right, verse 4. Deuteronomy 9, verse 4. Do not think in your heart, after the Lord your God has cast him out before you, saying, because of my righteousness, the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. Don't think it's because I, I, I'm fond of y'all, because you guys are a rebellious bunch. But this is the reason why I'm, I want to destroy this land. Are you ready for the reason? Because, why? But it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is driving them out before you. It is not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart, verse 5, that you go in to possess their land. But because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord your God drives them out from before you that he may fulfill the word which the Lord swore to your fathers. All right, so God is even saying, like, hey, guys, like, I'm not kicking, I'm not destroying these guys because of you. You're very rebellious. I'm destroying them because I'm, these guys are wicked. What they do is wicked. This, these sons of Anak are wicked people. Wickedness. God remembers what he did in Genesis chapter, it talked about in Genesis chapter 6. All right. Show you more about these giants. We're, we're in Deuteronomy. Okay, L -l let me do my, my, my next scripture. Um, give me a second. Let me get my text. All right. Let's go to, if you hold, hold where you are in Deuteronomy, let's go to Matthew. Matthew chapter 22, verse 30. All right. Now, this is literally the only scripture that, let me call them my opponents for today, used to defend, oh, you know, the sons of God could not be spirit beings, right? This is a scripture that's used. All right. Verse 30. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. Okay, that's the scripture they use, right? That because the Bible says angels are not given into marriage in heaven, that means that it's not possible that the angels could have been able to see the daughters of men and come down to the earth to sleep with them. However, let's read that verse again, shall we? For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage but are like what? Of God in? Okay. In, not on earth? In hell? No. Now we see in 2 Peter chapter 2 and in Jude that God casts these spirit beings and consigns them to a portion of hell for eternity. Not all of them, but some of them to hell for eternity. So they're not in heaven. Because in heaven, it is true. Angels are not to marry. Angels do not marry in heaven. They are not given to marriage in heaven. These angels, however, Peter describes it this way, they left their heavenly abode. They left their duties. God's order for them in heaven is that they do not marry. They saw the daughters of men, and they were like, wow, the daughters of men are fair. We're going to rebel against God's order, which is you do not marry. You are not given to marriage. We're going to go down to the earth. We're going to sleep with these women. And then out of our wickedness, giants are produced. So there is nothing in Matthew chapter 22 that says angels cannot marry. It says they, are, they do not marry. It didn't say they cannot marry. It says they do not a Christian does not curse other people, right? Can you curse other people? You can, but should you curse other people? No. A Christian does not steal. Can a Christian steal, however? Yes. If he decides to rebel against the spirit man in him and go with his flesh, then he will steal. So, yes, the angels in heaven do not marry. It does not say they cannot marry. That little twist gets these theologians 
jumping and creating a whole stupid theology they cannot defend properly. That's, that's literally, I've studied so much, that's literally the only verse they have to defend the fact that, oh, it was not demonic beings. No. Yes, they're right in the fact that the Bible says that these angels are not to be married. But in marrying the daughters of men, they were already disobeying God's order. The same way Satan, Lucifer, this great foe of old, was he supposed to ride up into the high heavens and displace God and be? No, that's not what he was supposed to do. But he chose to do that. Was he supposed to rebel with other angels against God? No, but he did it. He defined God's order and brought about the chaos we now see in the world. So, right there, it doesn't state that they are unable to do it. It states that they do not do it. All right, have we established that? Anybody in a position there? Okay. I'll show you a little bit more. Joshua chapter 11, verse 21. Joshua 11, verse 21. And at that time, Joshua came and cut off the what? The Anakim from the mountains, from Hebron, from Debir, from Anab, from all the mountains of Judah, and from all the mountains of Israel, Joshua utterly destroyed them with their cities. Verse 22, none of the Anakim were left, were left in the land of the children of Israel. They remained only in Gaza, in Gath, and in Ashdod. All right, let's talk about Gath for a little bit. Who is the famous giant from Gath? Goliath, Goliath of Gath. All right, so there, there, were, there, were a, 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 there were there was a lot of giants in the land of the Philistines. So Joshua took the whole land. He defeated the Anakim there. So, so you, can, you can start to see the arc of God's plan to destroy these giants that are not in his plan. They're not in his plan. They're not in his plan. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll read another scripture. Deuteronomy chapter 3. Let's, let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter, chapter 3. Verse, verse 11. But actually, before we go to 11, let's go to, yeah, but yeah, verse 11. We'll just do verse 11. For only Og, the king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of... Of the giants. Indeed, his bedstead was an iron bedstead. This was not a normal man. Because the regular bed would not work for him. This, this is a gigantic guy. Is it not in Rabbah of the people of Ammon? Nine cubits is its length. And four cubits its width. According to the standard cubit. This was a big guy. Now, I converted that in the Jewish conversion to what we use, the metric standard. Do you know how long his bed was? Guess, in the conversion. 18 and a half feet long. All right? Oh, okay, sorry. I was supposed to. Okay, I, okay, I gave you the length. I gave you the length. Guess, guess the width. Nine. Six. I'll say my wife won the day. Eight feet, four inches wide. You were close. You were, you were a few inches off, but you were close. There you go. <laughs> you can tell I didn't give her, um, you know, any help her head because she didn't get it to the right inches. So there you go. No cheating. No cheating in this. That's how big. This guy's bed was. How many of you have a bed that big? <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I don't think Bed Bath & Beyond or Ashley Furniture or Matthew's Brothers, uh, even if you did a special order, I don't know if, you know, those guys in China would be like, wait, did you say it was eight and a half feet wide? Like, mm, maybe, maybe wrong, wrong. Yeah, this is, this is <laughs> false order here. We're not going to build this, right? We're, uh, no, no. 
This is not a human being. That's way too big for a human being. This guy was a big guy. He was a big guy. King Og of Bashan was that's a giant. Huge. Big, big guy. And verse 12 says, And this land which we possess at a time from our. So this was the land. This was the land of these giants. Right? You go to verse 13. It says, The rest of Gilead and all Bashan, the kingdom of Og, I gave to half the tribe of Manasseh. All the region of Argob with all Bashan was called the land of the... You know what? That's a very good title for a Hollywood movie. <laughs> Come on. You know, let me get Spielberg on the phone. Like, come on, I've got an idea for you. The land of the giants. Let's make a movie about that. Yeah. We'll get some really tall guys to try to get something as close as possible. So, so this, was not, this was not a random phenomena, right? Like, this was, this was a thing that was happening. God was destroying these people from the land and taking the land and giving it to the children of Israel. And these guys were... They were, they, they were an insult to God because it was against God's order. Now, think about this. Many, 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 many years had gone by with these beings on the earth. That does not mean that God stopped being angry at them. You know, sometimes in society we kind of think, well, if we've accepted it for a while, then we can kind of work with it and God is going to be okay with it. Well, no, no, God, God does not change. If he hates something, he's not going to stop hating it next week or next year or in 10 years from now. If it's a defiance of his order, it will be a defiance of his order 100 years from now. And that's why Jesus did not come to what? Destroy the law. He came to fulfill it because God is the same. God does not change. God loves righteousness and he hates sin. He hates transgression. And it's the same thing. He didn't stop hating the fact that these giants existed. Giants on the earth. All right. Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 18. 2 Samuel chapter 5. 2 Samuel 5, verse 18. This is one of David's wars with the Philistines. The Philistines also went and deployed themselves in the valley of Rephaim. All right. Now, what's Rephaim? Rephaim means giants. All right. So it's not just a random Hebrew word. All right. That word means giants. Rephaim. So David inquired of the Lord, shall I go up against the Philistines? He had to because, man, you're going to a land of giants. So the valley of Rephaim is the valley of giants. The word Rephaim, again, means giants, a giant race. We, we, we see this constantly. Um, First Chronicles chapter 11, First Chronicles 11, verse 15. Now, of the th now three of the thirty chief men went down to the rock to David into the cave of Adullam. And the army of the Philistines encamped in the valley of Rephaim. It was still the same valley, a valley of giants. David then was then in the stronghold. And the garrisons of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. So now we know, and I've established this fact before, we know that the, the Jews, the Israelites, had a constant, long-running feud with the Philistines, right? They, they were their eternal enemies, right? I mean, I can't think of a modern-day rivalry that goes, that went as long as the rivalry between Israel and the Philistines. Because their rivalry went for a long, long time, right? We see the rivalry start when the children of Israel come into Canaan. It goes through the times of the judges. It gets to the time of Saul. David appears on the scene it, for hundreds of years. For hundreds of years. It was in the whole, they were fighting the Philistines the entire time of the book of Judges. And the book of Judges was over 400 years. Over 400 years, right? The Philistines had fought with Israel for a long time. And many times, unsurprisingly, because the Israelites rebelled, the Philistines actually whooped the Israelites a lot. 
And then, of course, what would be the response of the Israelites? Oh, God, forgive us. You know, so, so this was not a, this was not a, um, this was a, this was a, I, I can't use the word friendly foe, but this was a familiar foe. This was a familiar enemy. The Israelites knew the Philistines very well because they fought them a lot. I mean, a ton. All right. Now, these Rephaim, and as some other places, you know, the Horites call them the Amim. So different people call them different things. Some people call them the Anakim. They were there. Who were they? Genesis 6. These were the produce of the sons of God having intercourse with the daughters of man and in so doing producing giants. There are other verses I would have told you tonight, but we don't have the time. It talks about having them having six fingers and, 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 and you know, on, on their foot, right? These, that, even, even a doctor will say, okay, that's a, what would we call it? A deformity, right? Because it's not, that's not the norm. The norm of human beings is to have five fingers on one hand and five on the other, and five toes on one and five on the other, right? That's the normal form. These irregularities are not God's design. That height is not God's design. All right, God loves you to be in kind of the five to seven in that range, somewhere there, right? That's, that's, that's God's order. If someone shows up here and is eight foot tall, everybody will go, whoa. <laughs> like, okay, that's different. That's something else. There's a reason why that, 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 that door goes as only as high. Why, why didn't we make it all the way to the... To the top. Because we're not expecting some guy that's taller than that. Right? I mean, if we do, ooh, I don't know. It would be like, wait, are we, are we, is God showing us visions of giants? Have the giants come back? No. 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 All right. A theory I will, I will support from next week is God destroyed these giants twice. The first time he did was during the flood. He destroyed them before the flood. The Bible is clear that he was mad that this was happening. And he destroyed them then. However, they seem to pop up again after the flood. As we see in all these scriptures we've read in Deuteronomy, right? They popped up. Why did it pop up? We'll finish with where we started. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 6. And then, of course, we'll come back to it next week. Chapter 6. There were giants on the earth in... So are, you, are, you, are you there with me? All right. Verse, sorry, I should have told you the verse. Verse 4. Genesis chapter 6, verse, chapter six, verse 4. There were giants on the earth in those... But, and also, afterward. All right. It, there is a reason the author is saying they were, then he, they were there here and also afterward. Because it's clearly talking about that scripture, that chapter, and chapter 7 and 8 is talking about the flood of Noah. Right? So it's saying there were giants on the earth before the flood. And there were also giants after the flood. Okay. Are you ready for this? My friendly theologians say, the sons of God were from the line of Seth. Okay. Now the line of Seth is where Noah's line comes from. Right? Shem, Ham, and Japheth, his three sons. All right? Okay. Three sons. Here's my question to you. Was anybody in the family of Noah... Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives and children. Was there, were there any giants in that mix? No. Okay. So, if it was, if the sons of God were not angels, but they were men from the line of Seth, as these theologians say, if there were no giants in the ark, where did these other guys pop up from? Because God destroyed everything that was not in the ark. 
And the only beings in the ark were Noah and his three sons and their families, right? Shem, Ham, and Japheth. There was nobody else. The Bible says the flood was over the entire world. Everything was destroyed, right? The entire earth. So, I'm sorry. If you're saying these giants are from the line of Seth, that means Shem, Ham, and Japheth, that God saved in the ark had giant blood. Because the line of the world as we know it today, we, we are the children of Noah. We're from his line. Right? Now, of course, you could go into all the uh, physiological and historical, you know, Shem went, you know, Ham went to Africa, and Japheth went to Europe, and there's, there's stuff, but that's not for today. But at least we know, biblically, that's, that's, our, that's, our, that's, our, that's our tree line. Right? So, if, if the sons of God refer to normal human beings, that means that those giants, because the Bible says they were there before, and God wiped them out with the flood, they were also there afterward from Genesis chapter 6 verse 4, and of course proved by all the other verses in Deuteronomy and all the fights that Israel has with the Anakim and the Rephaim. So that means that God basically made a pointless decision to destroy the Rephaim in the flood. Because after all, there would be new Rephaim. So what external factor had to be? What's the external factor? More stupid angels <laughs> deciding that, oh, the daughters of men are still very beautiful. And going to go sleep with them and producing giants, the Anakim. Even if you did not believe in my theory, you would at least admit that there's no other theory that's plausible in that circumstance. All right? And then you would just be an agnostic for Stoney. In that, just me, not God. So, these had to be spirit beings. These had to be spirit beings. That's okay. What did I do all of that 45 minutes of teaching for? Good. We're walking through the origins of demons. Fallen angels that rebelled against God. Not in just not one time, but several times. They started when Satan decided to take a host of angels. For it was the first time. And rebelled before creation of the earth. And Adam rebelled against God then. They rebelled again. Again, when the world had been created and the daughters of men, the world was multiplying like we read. They rebelled again. And then after the flood, another drove rebelled again. Defying God's order. And what we see from all that is demonic beings. Okay, can we stop that there tonight? 